in fact, from at least one of these three gentlemen that you see. And there are many more we might not have even known or mentioned. But at the end of the day, the lessons we do learn is we do leave back an impact, and we do live on. And that's the kind of inspiration I think these three gentlemen have left behind as well. We've been talking a lot about the future, and I've been mentioning, of course, on and off, and I really can't help it because I'm an educationist at heart. We will need to talk about the future in the sense what is the present and how things will move on. Uh, we've seen the evolutions in the technology. We've been discussing that as well. We've been looking at the skills and the competencies. We've been discussing that as well. If I may share an anecdote from Skatema, where I belong to, we were serving uh, someone in South Africa, and the gentleman came up and he says, brilliant, blown away, applying it in our life, but I must confess, sir, that our souls are dead by now. We would like you to go back to school. Tell those boys and girls that this is what they should be thinking. This is how they should be approaching life. So we, at, at least, have made that effort to make a program to go back to school rather than send back to school. But let's hear what schools are doing themselves. And who more apt than Dr. Tebe, I would request you please come on stage and share what FCC is talking about in a liberal arts education as a basis of, for good leadership. Dr. James A. Tebe, the rector for FCC. Delighted to be able to be with you here this afternoon and uh, have appreciated enormously the sessions that we have been uh, listening to. Uh, it's a, a world-class presentations uh, that we have. Uh, uh, one thing that I did pick up on a, a lighter side is that all the money that we spent in Legos for our children, our three boys and, and one daughter, if I had taken that and, and uh, invested it in one of the several good companies that are re representing, represented here, I would be able to live comfortably to the 100 years old that I'm supposed to be reaching sometime, rather than spending that money in, in Legos. But uh, um, anyway, uh, I've appreciated greatly what it is that we've learned here. I, I would like to take just one, uh, 30 seconds of my time, I'm going to stick to time, uh, and I'd like to ask uh, each of us to stand up, turn around once, and then sit down. These sessions are long. If you don't wish to stand up, you don't have to, but stand up, turn around once, and then sit down. And then, uh, thank you very much, and then we'll begin. Thank you. It takes a risk in doing this because then the conversations also begin and one makes connections with other people at their table. When I first came, mine will be more of a personal story coming here. When I first came to Pakistan and, and came into this role of rector at uh, uh, FC College in Lahore, uh, one of the things I did was to try and visit different companies and talk with the CEOs or the HR people to discover what kinds of uh, students or what kinds of professions that they were looking for, what kinds of people did they want to hire, and then commend our students to them. I had the opportunity to visit the Dewu Bus Company and talked with the CEO of the Dewu Bus Company, which was close to us, and I asked him what kind of students, or what profession, what should our students be studying if they were to try and get a career, a job with Dewu? He said, I don't care what they study. He said, what I want is somebody who can make decisions, who can think, make decisions for themselves, and to lead. He said, it doesn't matter what they study. Please give me somebody who's able to think. That was what he was asking for. And I discovered, too, when I came here, that there's a hierarchy in education in Pakistan. If one's very intelligent and capable, one does medicine or does engineering. That's what you try to do. And then the, it goes down the list until you get down to the humanities and to the social sciences and humanities, and those who are not as capable then take and study those. One of the things that people ask and constantly ask is what kind of job does a student get as soon as they graduate? What is the amount of money that they earn? And how many of your students are employed and actually have that job? The purpose of education is to get that first job and to be able to be uh, successful in learning. Subjects like medicine and engineering, there are certain facts and principles that need to be learned. And a discipline is necessary. I don't want to have surgery from a doctor who has not taken the discipline of learning medicine properly and learning where the organs are in the body. I want them to know that and to have that, those facts down. And so getting that job and learning a discipline are an important part of education, 
but it is only a part of education. There's much more to it than that. How is new knowledge created and how is new knowledge applied? How are new jobs created in a world with an expanding population? And it's much more important than learning a discipline or getting that well-paid job. And this is where a liberal arts education actually comes in. A liberal arts education is an approach to learning that empowers individuals and prepares them to lead with complexity, diversity, and change. It provides students with broad knowledge of the wider world in science, culture, society, etc., as well as an in-depth study in their specific area. I like to say at FC College, you've heard it, it isn't original with me, that education is what is left when you forget what you have learned in your class. Education is what is left when you forget what is learned in your class. It is the tools for further learning, for preparing a person to be a lifelong learner. How important that is when we've heard session after session about how we don't know what the future holds. And a liberal arts education particularly prepares us for jobs that do not yet exist. It prepares us for jobs that do not yet ex ex exist. Dr. Masadik Malik uh, gave a good example of what is going to be coming on into the future. And uh, how is it that we prepare for that when we can't specifically prepare for it? It's the ability to see beyond local horizons and to bring about change from the world in which we live. There's a story, that I, a, a joke that I read about where two fish were swimming in the ocean. Uh, young, young fish, they were swimming in the ocean and they were uh, talking with each other and a, a senior fish, an older fish, was coming the other direction. And as he saw these two young fish, he said, how's the water, boys? And they said, fine, sir, fine. And he swam on by and then the one young fish said to the other young fish, what does he mean by water? What does he mean by water? It's the very thing that they were living in and understanding and didn't even understand it. Well, a liberal arts education and education helps us understand the environment and the water in which we live and think critically about our environment. The higher a person goes in leadership, the more abstract their thinking needs to be. When you have an initial job, you do the job and the task that's there. But the greater, the farther up in leadership you go, the more abstract in the concepts you have to have that are there. This liberal arts education now is, in, is under attack in the West. It was very popular and very much a part of the educational system. But you'll be interested to know that it actually came originally, well, it, was, it existed in the Muslim world. It, it existed back in the Greek times. It came over and into the Muslim world, and it was there. It was housed within the Muslim world for a number of years before it went on to the West. And isn't it time that it would come back uh, into the Muslim world? I attended a conference in January, the Council of Independent Colleges and Universities, which is the largest such group that meets in the United States with some uh, uh, 800 heads of universities that are part of this that was meeting in Florida. And the number one theme was the attack on liberal arts education, the liberal arts education. How is it that we're going to fight it, the importance of it that's there? And in that, there was a study, a longitudinal study of what this education, this education produces. Uh, Foreman Christian College is part of a, uh, an association called the Global Liberal Arts Alliance, which is made up of 50% uh, universities in the United States, colleges and universities in the United States, and 50% of those that are outside the country. And the director of this was doing a study, a longitudinal study, on what a liberal arts education actually can produce and do. And as he explained it, he pointed out, he pointed out that in this longitudinal study, by virtually every single metrics that they were measuring, students who had this education progressed farther and better than those who had comparative educations in other places. It, it, they did much better. They're the ones who came up in terms of leadership, whose pay was greater in the long run, and who have been listed in what we know as who's who, people who are successful in their areas, and they're listed in who's who. One very good example, and we've heard many examples today, both in Pakistan and internationally, was Steve Jobs, of how a liberal education produced innovative leadership. 
He never graduated from college, to my knowledge, but he attended a small liberal arts college, Reed College, and he says of this, if I never had dropped in on that single calligraphy course in college, the Macintosh computer would never have had multiple typefaces proportionately and proportionately spaced fonts. He lived sleeping on the floor in, his, uh, uh, in, in a friend's room. He audited classes because he couldn't afford to take the expensive classes in, in, in the college, but it helped to shape him in his thinking so that he had a very innovative approach to education. What are the marks of this type of liberal arts education? Broadly based educated in different types of courses. At FC College, students are required to take general ed classes, and most of them do not declare their major until the second half of their second year. They need to take the courses and discover what it is that they would like. They have freedom to pursue their own interests. At one graduation in 2014, I asked our graduating class in the brief speech at the end how many of them had changed what it was that they were planning to study when they came, from, when they came to FC College. And more than half of them put up their hands. Those students are more what God created them to be than had they come in there predetermined what they were going to study and stuck with it. We have many different societies and planned activities, 38 societies with 350 activities that these, study, that these students lead and operate in a year, and there's a constructive engagement of co-curricular activities that come along with the actual education that's there. If you wish to learn a little bit more about FC College, back in the corner there's a booth, there's information there, and there are our students and some of our faculty who can tell you more about that. But many of our students trace what they learned and how they developed to these co-curricular activities and the changes that those brought about. Classroom learning is part of it, but not the only part. And then, of course, the third thing is personal mentorship and time with faculty. The opportunity to be advised and to spend time with students and to talk with them, all of this can be done. Now, I remember some years ago after I, I went to Indiana University, which is not considered a liberal arts institution, it's a big state university, and uh, uh, when I was doing further studies, my wife was working in a doctor's office as a receptionist, and, and the doctor had taught her to do some things there, and I went to pick her up after work, and she wasn't, a, a, the doctor's time was going late, like these sessions are going late, and uh, so I had to sit and wait, and I was sitting in the waiting room and was waiting for her to get off work, and there my... Uh, 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 there was a woman who was sitting there. She began to talk with me. She said, oh, she said, you know, she came up, to the, up into the northern area to Boston in order to uh, uh, be there for the season. Uh, she was a socialite. And then she went down to Florida in order to in enjoy the warmer climate during the winter. And then she asked me, she said, well, where did you go to? Uh, where did you get your education? And I proudly said, Indiana University. And her response was, oh, that's too bad. But not all of us can be educated like that, uh, like, 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 uh, like we would want to be. And I thought, I was a bit offended. I thought I got a perfectly good education at I Indiana University. But later, when I went to Princeton and was studying uh, uh, in a postgraduate degree there, I found out that there was a whole different way in which education could be presented in a liberal arts institution where young people learn to be leaders and where they engage with their faculty and they can learn and they can develop. We heard, we were encouraged, and we were invited to hear all sorts of different perspectives. It was at the time, shortly after the Iranian revolu revolution, and Princeton University invited a, a, an Ayatollah to come and be a visiting faculty for one year there. Why? So we can hear his perspective of, of uh, how he understands uh, the world. And constantly different types of thoughts were brought there so that we could learn and we could develop. The young people who attended that university were better prepared for and expected to lead. And when we have educated our children or seen them educated, we have put them in those kinds of institutions that would give that type of education. I talked with us when we were at FC College, there was a, uh, uh, students were complaining that their parents didn't understand what type of education was happening there. And so we had an event where students invited their parents and we explained what a liberal arts education was to the parents with the students present and a, a number of them came. And at the end of this, one father came to me 
and said to me this. He said, you know, he said, I have five children. My youngest now has come to FC College to study. Uh, uh, he said he is doing a double major. He comes in the early morning. He stays until evening. He comes home, he takes his food for his evening meal, and then he studies into the night, and the next day he goes off to the college. He's enthusiastic, he's involved in different societies, and he's changing. He said, had I known that this type of education was available, I would have had all my children study here, um, uh, because it gives them a broader, a broader perspective in wanting to learn and to grow. It's possible to get a liberal education through other means apart from the conscious commitment on the part of the institution. I'm an example of that. Many others are examples of that too. You can learn in companies, you can learn in many other ways. But why not have our educational institutions do something that consciously focuses on a preparation for the future and a broad-based understanding of multiple disciplines that will enable us, enable us to face the future and to meet those jobs that we do not know, uh, do not know what they will be in that future. We will get much more much more out of this highly desirable education if we consciously work to encourage it and develop it in our educational system. And these are the people who will be our leaders of tomorrow. Let me close with the example, the well-known example of Alama Iqbal. He studied in the Scotch school in, uh, uh, in, in Murray, in, in um, uh, uh, Sialcote. He then attended Murray College and he studied pre-engineering before going on to government college. That sounds so typical today. Everybody wants to go into pre-engineering with the expectation of going into engineering. Many people could supervise the construction of a bridge, but very few people can write with the insight that earned Iqbal the title of Shaire Mashrik, the poet of the East, or have the foresight and the intellectual authority to conceive of the nation of Pakistan he went on to study philosophy at government college and was influenced by a philosophy teacher there. And he was the one who, who developed and then was the one, of course, who conceived the whole concept of Pakistan. And think what Pakistan would have lost had Allama Iqbal been an engineer and only an engineer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tebe. Um, I just hope that no one misheard. Alam Iqbal was not in favor of making bridges and just bridges. He was wanting to make the nation. Just to clarify. All right. All right. Uh, I'd like to request uh, Ms. Hamida Fawad, the GM of PSDD, to please come on stage and present Dr. Tebi that mystery black box as a giveaway as a souvenir. All right, folks, um, I have a feeling you guys are going to be very happy when I make this announcement. Lunch will be served on time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it works with the Lahori crowd. I know one, right? Because I am one. But before we do that, before we do that, um, there is something that we need to all understand. We all have come down from a particular kind of generation which has, which has passed down certain things which we call the professional attitude. This person who's defined as being professional, as a professional human being, is one who tries to completely separate personal life from work life. Essentially, not be a human being. Essentially being just a cold machine who just comes in, clocks in, and works and clocks out. And then you have spent at times, unfortunately, your entire professional life not knowing the person sitting next to you as a fellow human being. In fact, I remember there was a random survey that was once done and it came out very, very sad that the best friends that you have are generally those out of your work crowd. And imagine when you spend most of your life in work, at work, and yet your best friends are not from work. That's kind of a very sad life, if you ask me. But what is important for us to understand is that we need to understand each and other as human beings. I recall this one very, it seems very mundane, but I recall this one exercise which manifested in front of me and this organization which name I would not take. And the CFO 
and no offense to CFOs, well, I'm talking to HR crowd, so well, take offense, but CFOs are considered very cold, serious, hard, tight-fisted people, and they, they are the ones who bury their noses into those books and balancing them and trying to cut short this, that, and here. But when this gentleman took the initiative and introduced his bio, and I do not mean a CV, but the human being that he is behind that, and when he started narrating of how he, coming from a, a, a lower middle class family, a land owned family from Sargoda, and him being the number eight child, and the father saying, all right, this one is the smartest, I'm gonna make him an engineer. I'm gonna put him to school. And all the other siblings did not go to school. But he was, and he excelled, he, he was pushed. And then how he moved to Rawalpindi and then Islamabad on top of a truck, and then climbed whatever he did, and the tragedies that he faced in his personal life, not professional life, and the pride that he had in his personal life of his children, and then all of a sudden, everyone started seeing this, what they initially called the monster CFO, as a fellow human being. And they could empathize with him. Yeah, yeah. And that is the secret that we all need to do so. If you don't believe me, just Google, and the words literally will be Google. That is one of the first words. HR, the secret of research. And they said the, the ultimate secret after God knows how many years of research what this lady did, who's now the HR head, was the HR head of Google. She said it was essentially connecting people as human beings. I would like you to take this opportunity to understand what this and other things mean. Behind the titles, there is a human being. Believe it or not, as human as you and I are. And to give you an, a perspective on this, I'd like to request, on addressing the cultural transformation and organizational change, I'd like to request Hassan Adnan Hemad, the director, HR, Coca-Cola Beverages, well, CCI, to please come on stage and give his perspective. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah? And can I have your attention? I am the last one between you and lunch. So I just need a little bit of attention. As Umair said, that you know, behind everyone, you know, a human being. So first thing I want you to do is take off your mask and put it.